Good morning, everybody. Good morning or afternoon already. How are you doing? Good. How are we doing on energy? Only, only that? How are we doing today? Good. Nah, that's better. That's way better. My name is, is Pablo Carlier, and I, I take care of uh, partner engineering for Iberia and Italy with Google Cloud. And I'm going to ask you to come with me on a journey from zero to auto machine learning using our, our experience and our findings in this travel that we had so many years ago. And, uh, and for that, I'd like to start with what people usually think when they hear about AI. So most likely, some of you are experiencing these things in your pockets right away, and you have things like this. Things like uh, can tag the pictures of your, your daughters or, or your kids. Uh, things that can suggest what uh, is the smart reply that you should have for one email or for a chat. And, uh, you're probably now thinking about image models or CNNs or recursive networks and things like that, but, but many people afterwards just go back to their companies and they, they start thinking, how do I start with AI? What's my starting point? So what I'd like to do is like to share what we did when we had the same question, because we had the same problem, and, and the fact is that our perception is not going to be very different to what you're going to see. So for us, machine learning is an algorithmic approach to making predictive decisions from data, and actually that part is, is important, extracting insights and taking decisions. And it's important that, that for that, you, you first have access to, to the resources you're going to need for that. So first, we're going to need access to data, that's for sure, and you probably know that already. Uh, then you're going to need to, we're gonna need to have access to, to algorithms to get the most out of that data. Check, we also have algorithms. And we're going to have to know what kind of predictions we're going to want to have. But most likely, you may be thinking about how to use this already. And that's the key part. Because in the end, we're going to use this to make predictions. And, and those predictions need to be applied to decisions. And we're not talking here about a couple of decisions a week. We're not talking here a couple of decisions a day. We're talking about millions of decisions. So for example, machine learning is a great technology that you can use for things like predicting whether a shopping cart is going to be abandoned or not in your e-site, in your e-commerce website. It's probably not the best technology to choose where to, f to plant a physical location, a physical store, because you do that, what, once a year? So you, first you need to understand the use case and, and what decisions you're going to be making. And probably if you're going to make a lot of decisions, then is where you start to think about machine learning. So what have we learned at Google in, in this journey? As you can imagine, We've had this challenge. We work with billions of users every day. Actually, we have eight projects, eight solutions that have each of them over one billion unique users every day. So that's, that's scale right there. And, and for that, we, we had to understand first how to use machine learning to address things that we were previously addressing through rules. So look for rules on your business. When we took a look internally, and we took a look at the models that we had been building, because now we're doing almost everything that we do with Google is now based on machine learning. When we took a look at the models that we were using, we got a bit surprised because we were, we were expecting to see LSTMs, uh, a lot of popularity with deep neural networks, but in the end, most of the networks that we have are actually multi-layer perceptions, very, very simple predictions based on structured data. Actually, the vast majority of what we do is based on structured data. It's not very fancy, it's not very, com very complicated. And most likely, you have the opportunity to do something very, very similar. For example, the challenges that we had um, at this scale, you, you can imagine that it would be very hard to code what to, to reply to someone who's looking for giants on Google. Depending on whether he coming, he's coming from San Francisco or coming from New York, I'm going to have to answer with a baseball team or a football team. Or if the question's coming from somewhere else, I'm probably going to have a response about tall people. But in the end, it's very hard to hard code this, and this explodes very quickly. And these are the kind of problems. Is someone having a beer already? So that, that's nice. So these kind of problems are the ones that we like at Google. You know, We like problems that explode. So in the end, uh, things like these are the ones that motivate us. Uh, this is another example of a great application of machine learning. Uh, when you need to understand how to best recommend content to someone on your streaming video platform, you may be tempted to take a look at the viewership data and, and get that data, and then start with the model, start with the assumptions that you make. And then, for example, try to extract which uh, parameters are going to be relevant 
have, take some assumptions and, for example, extract some data like the age, uh, the gender, uh, location, neighborhood, uh, income, and uh, past preferences, and then put that in your, in your cocktail thing and have an outcome. But once you start collecting enough data, you can turn it around. And you can actually start from the data. And if you start with the data, you don't leave anything behind. You can actually extract new correlations and discover new patterns that were invisible to you before if you were making those assumptions. And that way you can start gathering all the viewership data of everybody and then condense that, going through a model to the actual predictions you want to make for that user. And that's changing completely the perception of your users. So start with the data is a great strategy that we learned inside of Google. Another one is that this gives us the opportunity to reach customers that are far beyond our regular customer, to reach that long tail of users. That still constitutes a lot of the market, but you may not be reaching right now. And to do that, you need to, to create new experiences. You know, Andrew Yang, and, and, and he, he's not suspect for not liking models, you know? He was one of the founders of Google Brain, and he was the founder of Coursera afterwards, and he's right away, to my, to my perception, the best ever with communicating how machine learning works and explaining these algorithms and the math behind. But even himself says that it's not going to be the one with the best algorithms, but that one with the most data who's going to win. And there's the opportunity right there for us to start collecting data from other places and starting to collect data as well from places that were not necessarily the ones that we were expecting to collect. For example, no one would assume initially that it's relevant to gather tornado information to recommend movies on Netflix. And somehow it might make sense for you to do that. So don't uh, cut out yourself from opportunities of collecting different data. Just try to accommodate for diverse factors because those are going to enhance the experience of your users. And it's going to bring new opportunities for you. And now you have the chance to do that. And that's what we found out. Only last year, 8 billion devices were connected to the internet. And, and that's an opportunity to gather more and more data from the experiences of our users to have a different impact on them, to actually personalize their journey. And this is transforming everything. IoT is transforming everything. And we need to build solutions that can also accommodate for that future. It's changing dramatically every single industry. And we see it because we are doing that with every customer right now in the world. So the second is actually try to reach the long tail through personalization. But then I'm talking about getting more and more data. And the challenge with that is that eventually you can have to plan for that data. So our third finding was plan for the data you will have, not for the data you have right now. And when you do that, then, then you start gathering more data and you start to build the practices in-house that help you do that. But what happens when you reach a certain amount of data, which is, by, by, for instance, the amount of data you're going to need to do these things at scale? What happens when you reach the petabytes and the exabytes level? What happens is that, again, this problem explodes and that you end up investing so much effort and so many resources in actually building the infrastructure so your data science team and your data engineers can actually work. So you spend a very little amount of time extracting value from the data and a lot of time provisioning infrastructure, deploying it, operating, and a lot of money as well, which is not very efficient. So another recommendation was for us to change the way we're doing it internally. And that's why we have been investing in 20 years, we've been investing in, in a lot of technology around data problems. And now from Google Cloud, what we do is we package that in managed services that provide an end-to-end -end portfolio since the ingestion of data. Through its transformation, preparation, cleanup, engineering of data, and then feeding that into analytics or into real-time pl platforms where it can, which can, it can be consumed from our applications, and then fed into those machine learning cycles where we are augmenting that data. We've built a comprehensive set of solutions that are all serverless. So you minimize the amount of time that you need to actually invest in provisioning that. And that's a key differentiator as well. You need to invest in the right platform. And what we think we've done is we've made it very easy and very smooth for you to be able to do this, which is to actually spend the time on what matters to you, which is your problem, and delegate everything else to someone else, which incidentally could be us. So you can free up those resources and the most valuable resource in the world, which is the human imagi imagination, to actually putting it to the task of solving your business problem, which is what your company expects from you anyway. So to do that, Spotify has brought all the music of the world into Google Cloud. 
Twitter is moving 300 petabytes of data to move their whole Hadoop practice into Google Cloud. Because these companies are leading in their markets and they're seeing the value of actually abstracting themselves from all the tinkering from the down layers and actually bringing value to their business in the upper layers, which is where the data science is actually going to make, make a difference and where you're going to build that differentiation in the market. So the fourth finding was actually use a platform that lets you focus on your models and actually offers great infrastructure ready to use without configuration and great pre-built models. And that, that way we need to accommodate for ma many different runtimes and many different experiences. Because there are use cases where people are, are wanting to actually develop in their laptops and experiment with their Jupyter notebooks and, and accelerate the pace at which we are making hypotheses and predicting things. Some other people want to be deploying things at scale in the cloud and training and doing inference in the cloud. Some other people may be wanting to migrate between environments, and that's why something like Kubeflow exists. By the way, who's heard of Kubeflow? Who knows about Kubeflow? Can, can you raise your hands? All right, so who, who's heard about Kubernetes here? Kubernetes, yeah, you know Kubernetes, right? So the problem that we were seeing is not very different from the problem that we saw when we started the DevOps movement and the Agile development movement, which is the fact that developers are going to need portability, they're going to need modularity to compose different blocks, but everybody was building their own snowflake, you know, their own special ivory tower, their own combination of solutions. They only they knew how to integrate. It was very costly to maintain, almost impossible to deploy in production. And in the end, all the changes between environments from your laptop to production at scale meant downtimes. Enter Kubernetes, and we transformed the way that the application, was, uh, application development was accelerated. We are doing the same thing with machine learning right now, thanks to Kubeflow. So it's the same portability, the same composability, but now for your machine learning pipelines. So that, al that allows you to basically work in your laptop one way and then deploy it across any environment, across any cloud, across the perimeter, or whatever you want, using the same set of abstractions. So that's what Kubeflow offers. But of course, there's people that just want to do it in the cloud and do it at scale and use our technology to do that. We need to accommodate for that, and we need to, we need to provide that flexibility for those different runtimes. And again, when we need to scale across all those runtimes, we find the challenge of doing it with the right uh, capability to accommodate the storage of the data that we've been gathering and with the right compute power. So for that, you need to divide and conquer, as the, my, my, our professors in, in university used to tell us when we started programming. Divide and conquer, which means distribute the load, and then use bleeding edge compute. And that's what we're doing here. What we're doing is basically having more distributed solutions using the better hardware. And, and to, to illustrate what we mean by more powerful hardware, you know that this is all about actually multiplying tensors and multiplying matrices, right? So almost if any one of us could do it just with, with paper and pencil, it would just take us a long time to do it. But we may be able to do that. But the problem is that computers don't do it that way. So computers actually do it in what we call the ALU in a processor. So how many ALUs do we have in an Intel Xeon core? For example, we have eight, roughly. We use GPUs because instead of eight, we have 2,000 ALUs, more or less, in a typical GPU. Well, we build the tensor processing units because we have 32,000 ALUs in one TPU. So we're going from eight to 2,000 to 32,000 ALUs in one chip, in one ASIC. That's cutting edge power. That's the kind of power we're going to need. Because again, we're moving into higher levels of abstraction, and there are more and more use cases, and we're seeing it across every industry. It's image recognition for cars. It's actually predicting behavior and actually accommodating for better customer care through chatbots. It's, it's changing the way that we are filtering content in, when people are uploading images to the internet. It's, it's providing even uh, chatbots built for free and just without any single interaction with the machine learning layers and only modeling the conversation you want to have to improve your retail experience. And all these use cases are going up the stack and are demanding more and more from the, from the bottom layers. And that thing that they're demanding needs to be accommodated through an end-to-end -end portfolio. So basically, if we go back to, the, to, to what we were talking here about the power, and, and we take a look at the, the kind of storage that we're going to need for this. Storage is going to grow exponentially when you try to decrease your error rate linearly. And that, again, is a problem. Because for every incremental point that you want to drop your error rate, your curve for, for the data you're going to need is going to explode. 
So you better be ready for that, and you better have the right the big data practice in your organization to accommodate for that. And the other change is that the compute that you're going to need, why are you going to need those 32,000 ALUs anyway? Because the compute is also uh, growing exponentially with the time. So for example, just to illustrate that, take a look at that curve. That illustrates only the last six years in cutting-edge algorithms. The amount of power that you need to run cutting-edge machine learning algorithms has gone up, not tenfold, not a hundred times, not a thousand times, 10 million times in six years. So from the, from the cutting edge algorithms and models that of six years ago to the cutting edge of today, we need 10 million times more compute. It's impossible to follow that trend if you're investing in traditional ways of doing things. That's why all these use cases, all these, these businesses that are demanding this, expect a platform that abstracts this complexity from them and actually helps them focus on their problem, that industrializes a solution for that. And that's the portfolio that we've built. We've actually gone from totally personalized experiences that you can build and you can shape and you can actually create in, your, in our machine learning engine for the models and the part of the problem that you need to customize for yourself and we're ranging up to the packaged capabilities that we have developed internally. Because as you can expect, we also, also have this problem for image recognition, video analysis, translation, natural language, voice to, to text and text to voice. You're all seeing that in the services that you use today with Google. We have this problem, so what we've done is we've packaged these capabilities in APIs that are ready to use. And those APIs are now exposed, so every developer can use them and leverage our infrastructure, leverage our network, leverage our technology, and only worry about writing against the right API. And the first rule of uh, the machine learning club, it's just like Fight Club, you know, the first rule is that you don't build a model if you don't need to. The second rule of machine learning club is that you don't build a model unless you need to. So basically, don't build a model unless you necessarily need to. Try to split out your problem, address the pieces of your problem with the prepackaged APIs you can find, and then focus on your specifics for your custom model only where you need to. And that's what we do with the building blocks that we've, uh, we've created. That's what we do with the, with the integration of the collaboration tools and the community that's actually feeding data sets and feeding models and feeding innovation through things like Kaggle, for example. And what we're using to build and create vertical solutions that are ready to use for the market. Because we need to accommodate needs from the guys that are going to go deep and have the deep ML expertise and the ability to do it, to those that have never ever thought about using AI or machine learning for anything, but have a business need and want to build up on uh, top of this platform. And with minimal machine learning expertise, we need to open this up to the world. You know, Sundar Pichai, our CEO, is on the record saying that they believe that machine learning is going to be as transformative as electricity or fire. I believe that's a bit ambitious, but don't tell him, okay? So it's not that I don't trust it, but I think that it's a bit ambitious. But if we want that to happen, we need to democratize it. We need to open it to everybody. And that's why we've, we've not only invested in machine learning technology, but we've also invested in building that serverless platform for the previous part, for the machine learning to, to sit on top of a big data practice that's serverless and can let you dedicate your time to bringing value on the top. Because who can use AI today? Who's actually there with the expertise to build complex ML models? Well, it's in the numbers of the thousands of people in the world right now. And that's not very democratic. That's not everybody. There are maybe two million data scientists around the world. That's what we estimate. But there are 10 times that, the amount of people that are able to actually use an API and build something of value to their business with an API. That's the people that we need to reach. That's how you win, when you expose your capabilities to everybody. And not only to the Gandalfs and the wizards of the world that can actually extract the magic, you know, and the unicorns and all that stuff. I couldn't do it myself. So we need to democratize, uh, democratize this technology for it to have the impact that we expect that it may have. So that's why we've built something like AutoML. Who's heard of AutoML before? All right, you're going to be bored for this then. AutoML is basically a technology that builds a model for you. 
So you don't have to think about, about those things. You don't have to think about pre-processing your data. You don't have to think about how the model's going to look. You forget about the process of hyperparameter -tune, uh, um, hyper tuning. You, you forget about how uh, properly you've evaluated your labels, and you don't have to build your own confusion matrix. And, and of course, you don't have to deploy it in production, and you don't have to update it because we do it for you. So basically, what AutoML does is it's putting machine, mo machine learning to the task of creating machine learning models. And this is opening up the applications of those APIs that I shared before for use cases that are not generic, but personalized and tailored to the data of our users. Because we are very good, actually, at detecting shoes. But it's impossible that we were able to detect that specific shoe from your catalog if you're a retailer. We are good at detecting uh, hardware pieces. But it's impossible that we are trained to detect your hardware pieces. But we have the technology for you to actually do it. So that's what we're going to see right now in a demo if it works. So let's hope that everything's all right. Yep. So what you're seeing here is um, I'm basically logged into my cloud console. I am, I am going to honor The Simpsons today. So who likes The Simpsons here? I like The Simpsons. Who likes Apple here? I like Apple. Come on. What's wrong with Apple? Now, there was a problem with Apple in the past week, so we're going to try to honor Apple here. And what we tried to do is, uh, as you can see, there's, it's a very simple UI. There's no coding required. What I did is I wanted to build an image recognition model that would detect characters from The Simpsons. So in order to do that, I first need tagged pictures from The Simpsons, right? Who wouldn't want to have an image recognition model that recogni recognizes characters from The Simpsons? I mean, everybody likes that. So um, me assuming that someone would have done it already, I went to Kaggle. You know Kaggle, right? So I went to Kaggle, and of course, in Kaggle, you could find, actually, if you don't know to Kaggle, you should sign up for Kaggle right now. You found, you could actually see that there is many, many data sets, but there is indeed a data set of 20,000 images from characters of The Simpsons, which is crazy. But what I did is I basically downloaded that. And what did I do? I just created one data set. How do I do that? I just basically download that zip file, and I made sure that the zip file had the hierarchy uh, accommodating the characters in different folders. So it's basically one folder for Marge, one folder for Homer, one folder for uh, Grandpa Simpson, one folder for Mr. Barnes and everything. And I'll put all the images there, Actually, I didn't have to do it, because the guy that packaged it uh, at Kaggle had done it for me. So I just got that zip and uploaded it. How do I do that? Well, I just basically come to new data set, and then I upload it. And you can see that if it follows the right hierarchy, there's no labeling that I need to do. So that's what I did. It took me, what, 10 minutes, maybe, for it to upload the data set, and then the processing of the labels and things like that. And then once I did that, I had a model that was ready to be trained. So I logged in into the model. Mm -hmm. You can see that it was last updated some days ago. I can see the images that I have. I can see that I have, indeed, 20,000 images. You can see that I have lots of characters. Some of them, I only have a few pictures of them. So it's asking me to have at least 10 pictures per category. And it works pretty well with 10 pictures per category. This is another breakthrough of AutoML. You can actually have great results with very little amount of data. But it's also going to depend on your data set as well. So in the end, what I did is I just came here. Yep, I made sure that I had uh, properly labeled my things. Troy McClure, there you go. And then I clicked the Train button, which is basically coming here and clicking this button. If I click there, what's going to happen? AutoML is going to take care of me. And they're, they're just going to let me go over for a coffee. And then will send me an email when they're done. AutoML is going to explore all the different possible strategies, not all different combinations of hyperparameters, to actually converge to the optimal way of training this data set. It took like 35 minutes, something like that, less than one compute hour, as you can see, to actually create it. And uh, it created it with a pretty nice precision, right? And you can see the area under the curve, and you can see the recall and everything like that. You can see a full evaluation, actually, after the process finished, and you can see all the different parameters that you may want to be interested in, and who is being confused with whom. And Crab of Apple is going to be confused with, uh, with Flanders, uh, weirdly. I don't know why, but anyway. After, after that happens, you take a look at your training. If you're comfortable with it, you're done. That's it. You don't need to do anything else. The model is ready to be used. 
and we serve it. So how do we, how do, we do it? How do we actually put it to the task of being used? You basically click predict, and you have a very basic UI for you to test it, but you can also just copy and paste and integrate that into your application, either the REST API or the client libraries, and you can just call this API. Let's call it and see what happens. So what's going to happen is that I'm going to choose an, an image, and uh, my model is latent. It's waiting there. It's, it's, it's expecting that it's going to be used. If it's been so, so much time, I mean, if it's been some hours since it's been used, it'll probably go to sleep. So it's going to need a little bit of warm-up time eventually. And uh, if you're working with serverless functions and cloud functions and things like that, you might expect that. So I just was testing it some minutes ago, and that's why it responded like this the first time. If not, you may expect that the first request may be a little bit slower, but all the rest are going to work like a charm. And indeed, we have that it is Apu Nasapima Petilon with a 99.3 certainty. So I think that we should give a hand to Apu, right? I think that Apu, Apu deserves it. We like Apu. Thank you, my friend. We love you. I don't know what's wrong with him. So what would we see there? I actually had to click four or five times. Four or five times. From model, sorry, from data set to trained model in production. And of course, this is not only thanks to magic. This is because we've been investing in higher quality models and ways of serving those models in a way that scale and actually lead nest data. So AutoML is a great starting point for those who don't have the expertise. But it's not only for vision. It's for natural language. It's for translation, and it's coming for more and more solutions. But the thing is now, this is all right and good for the parts that you can commoditize of your problem. But that specific thing, that special sauce you're going to have to build for your problem, how do you make sure that you build it and you stay open and you stay portable and you avoid lock-in? Because that's a great challenge that we have ahead of us. To innovate and differentiate and build something that only you can build, but stay open in the, in the way. And that's something that we actually had to do ourselves because we recognized that AI is a team sport. And this is all about leveraging everybody in the organization or across organizations, and this is the magic of open source, to have 10 times the impact. We love having 10 times the impact. We love growing that 10 times. And this is what we needed to do. And how do we do that? How do we have more impact across the world with this technology? Well, the way to do it is two ways. First, you allow for reusability of content. And second, you allow for collaboration. And this is, again, not unlike what happened with the DevOps movement and everything that sparked Kubernetes. This is about leveraging innovation inside your organization, across teams in your organization, and across organizations, and allowing you to leverage instead of reinvent the wheel all the time. How can we do that? Well, that's why we're introducing two new solutions this week through breakthroughs that are going to help us go to the next level with this vision. And the first one is Kubeflow pipelines. So those of you that were familiar with Kubeflow, I invite you to just go over and take a look at it. Those of you that hadn't heard of Kubeflow before, first go and take a look at the David Aronchik and present in Kubeflow. Kubeflow is a project that started within Google, but is open source, and the rest of the community is going like crazy behind it. So Kubeflow pipelines is a workbench, is a, a workspace for you to actually start to compose, integrate, tail together, and then share, productize, and deploy your pipelines in a way that others can reuse it, in a way that you can move them from environment to environment in a simple way. So you're not building a complete work of art every time, but you just package it when it's ready, and others can plug on it and reuse it. And it's got a very, very nice UI, and it's got a very simple way of working. And what it does, it basically prevents this from happening. It prevents you from reinventing the wheel at every single team in your company. So we want you to work on one problem once and then reuse the solution for other problems. So this is going to accelerate tremendously the way that you're efficient with this. And actually, you have to build one recommendation engine across your company and then reuse the same pipeline packaged in a nice way for different problems. And then regular, regular developers without the, the specific expertise are going to be able to use that and apply it to several problems that you never thought of and uh, utilize solutions and technology that was Forgiven, uh, sorry, uh, was forbidden for them to use before. That was impossible for them to leverage. Because in, when you create this, that red part was limited only to those data scientists and ML engineers that actually knew how to do that. But the blue parts, many of us were able to actually do that. Once you package that pipeline you've created 
once you package that recommendation engine with its moving parts and its pieces together, and you can bundle it in something in an artifact that other can you use, the impact you can have grows exponentially. And then you can share it with the world. And this is the second breakthrough that we're announcing this week, and that's AI Hub. The same way that Git and repos and shared coding and GitHub changed the world, now we want to do that with artificial intelligence. And that's what AI Hub was built for. AI Hub is basically your one-stop AI catalog. It's, it, has, it has a platform for you to actually contribute, and we are going to be contributing. We're actually, in fact, starting to contribute right away today, sharing built recommendation engines ready to use for other companies, and not only from, from Google, but from Google Research, from DeepMind, and from more groups inside of Alphabet. And our partners, those companies that are out there, are also going to contribute to AI Hub, but you can also contribute your solution so others can build on top of it. It's like a marketplace of ideas for AI solutions that you have built using Kubeflow pipelines, or notebooks, or other ways of working with ML that you may be familiar with. And then it also has enterprise-grade role-based access control and privacy mechanisms, so you can use it as your own private repo for your own private company. So it's your internal repository as well of assets that's close to the world and only you can reuse if you want to work that way to share information confidentially and securely inside your organization. And then with one click, you can deploy in production on GCP or across hybrid environments using the magic of open source Kubeflow. This is how you stay open. So this is how it, how it looks, basically. The, this is a fragment of the introduction presentation that we ran the other day. But this is the experience that you're going to get. You're basically going to browse a store. You're going to look for pipelines. You're going to check for if you can contribute something. You can just click Add, give it a name, upload the tarball, upload your, uh, your documentation, and then it will be there for someone else to use. You can either make it public or not. And there, that's it. It's that simple for you to make that available in a standard format that now everybody can leverage. And this is something that's going to be open and remain open so everyone can use it. And after, what you can do is explore what others have put there. So basically, you can just start to browse what other pipelines are available to you, or what notebooks people have identified that may be interested and, and, and they have published, so you can reuse that. I've seen so many people building recommendation engines in the past year. They're all doing the same thing. It's wasting CPU cycles. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Just go there and grab one and iterate on top of that. That's the magic of offering a, offering a one-stop AI catalog for enterprises so they can uh, work with the type of content that they're looking for, either pipelines or notebooks or TensorFlow modules uh, or services for deep learning or whatever. Using the, the framework that you want to, it's not limited to TensorFlow, the same way that Kubeflow is not limited to TensorFlow. Using it uh, for, for different parts of your organization, uh, different development paths, across your entire AI workflow. So this is how you actually combine the power of sharing and the power of modularity and composability to have the greatest impact. And that's why you spin this flywheel and this virtuous circle of innovation in artificial intelligence in your company. And we know that because that's the way it's worked inside of Google. Basically, you start with search and discovery. Before, you, what was the rule of Machine Learning Club? You don't build a model unless you need to, right? Well, we packaged some solutions, and you saw it working. But for those that haven't been packaged, most likely someone's already worked on that before. The same way I didn't have to label 20,000 pictures of The Simpsons, most likely someone has already built that pipeline before for you. Just go search, discover if your problem is already solved. Then deploy it, fine-tune it, customize it to your needs, deploy it again in production, at scale, whatever you want, in my cloud, in your cloud, everywhere in the perimeter using tensor processing units the size of a fingernail. So you can have hardware accelerated inference inside of a light bulb or in a moving train. And then contribute back and actually publish your improvements and publish your fine tuning so others can build on top of that. This is how you stay open. This is how you make a difference. So uh, let's recap, and then we'll, we'll open it up for questions for some moments. What were our findings, going back to the start? W we found that machine learning can be used for many things for which today we are building rules. If you find yourself writing a lot of rules to make decisions, that's probably a good idea to explore machine learning for that use case. But it has to be a lot of decisions. Don't do it for one decision a month. The second is start with your data. 
personalize the experience that you're going to get from your users and start from the data to actually do that. Gather as much data from as many different sources, even sources that you may not have thought of before that. And then when you see that data start to explode, make sure that you have the practice in-house to actually handle that data and prepare for the data you're going to need in years, not for the data that you have right now. Because that data is going to come. And then, bet on a platform that actually abstracts the complexity and frees up resources so you can focus on your specific part of the problem and delegate everything else to someone else. And that's the way you innovate, that's the way you stay open, that's the way you scale, and most of all, that's the way we make it easy together. So, thank you very much, everybody. And now, I'll be, I'll be more than happy to take a couple questions. Afterwards, I'm going to be sitting as well in that, um, in that armchair that's just, just around the corner. So, we can also have a discussion later on for, for a quarter of an hour, I think I'll, I'll be there. But I'll be more than happy to address any question. One question. We have to choose one question. All right, can I ask a question? No, it has to be. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. We have time for one question. They tell me. Hi. Thank you. Uh, can you give us more details about the auto ML for natural language processing? Sure. I think I actually have a demo on that. And this wasn't staged, by the way. So, hold on. What natural language does is, is, a, is a bit different in the application, but it's very similar in the process. So, what we're going to try to do here is actually get samples of text. And the natural language API by itself is already very smart. So, if you go to our cloud.google.com slash um, I don't know, I think it's ML or AI or something like that. You can actually test it yourself. And you can see that we can do syntax analysis, we can analyze sentiment, so if we can know by the text if it's a positive or negative sentiment and the magnitude of that sentiment. We can know what intent you, you have in, in that sentence, what you're talking about. Is it a question? Is it a complaint? And we know uh, what entities are there in your sentence as well. Are you talking about ob objects? Are you talking about, um, is this a verb? Is this an a subject. So it's very smart by itself, but it's limited to generic text. For example, the news um, industry has a problem categorizing news. And sometimes, I mean, I like football, for example, and I, when I go to, to marca.com and I see how they're, they're writing uh, a news, a report from a, from a game, they may not mention the game soccer or the, game, the name football, that word, at all. Not even the names of the teams, maybe. They would say Los Madridistas, Los Merengues, or something like that. They may not even say the name. But you need to categorize that. So with AutoML, natural language processing, what you can do is you can fine-tune that engine so it starts to recognize patterns that are specific to your needs. So you can learn how to, for example, categorize news in sports, in politics, in international, in uh, obit, whatever. What I'm doing here, this is actually a model that I built to try to predict um, from from uh, questions from the Parliament of India. So there's many people in India, and there are many questions that come to their Parliament, and they need to be categorized and routed to the, to the department that makes sense. But when a question comes, it's not necessarily evident what ministry it should go to. Of course, the question is asked to a minister in particular, but when you're indexing the questions afterwards and you're routing them in the internal systems, they need to understand if the question was intended for the Minister of Agriculture or the Minister of Food, which may not be the same one, or the Minister of, Minister of Industry or Economy. So what I did is, I, again, I went to Kaggle, and I went to a data set, and apparently there's a data set with thousands of questions from India. So what I did is, obviously, I just built a model about that. And you can see that there are the, the tags, the labels that I'm using here are the categories that I want to use for categorizing that content. But then it's going to take those layers of the model that we have been perfecting over years to do natural language processing, and then add an extra layer and use transfer learning to build a model that's going to be tailored to actually specialize in that last layer into your categories. And now it's detecting the trends and the patterns and, and the explicit constructions that make one question actually go for human resources and not housing. And uh, if I were to predict and I were to say, I would like to understand India's 
strategy for wheat and corn crops, you might assume that this may be related to agriculture in a very, very hard certainty way. Right? It's not unlike the same way that uh, vision is working. It's just applied to a different thing, but the technology behind it is very similar. Take an API that's working, take a model we've perfected, and then add an extra layer, use transfer learning to fine tune it to your use case. As the expert later. Thank you. So, c can you repeat that with the microphone? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, he's uh, going to be in as the expert if you have any more questions. And also, you can go to the app and rate the, uh, the talks. Thank you. And also, I'm available on Twitter, LinkedIn, or, or later. I'm, I'm Pablo Carlier again, and it was very nice to meet you. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.